Hey, welcome to the Uproar Live YouTube page. We are excited that you are gonna be joining in and watching this message. We know it's gonna be encouraging, we know it's gonna be inspiring, and we know that it's gonna be life-changing. So go ahead and share this with a friend. Don't keep it to yourself, but share the good word. While you're at it, go ahead and like and subscribe to our page so that you can get updated when we post new content each and every week. Last but certainly not least, if while you're watching, you want to get connected and or you want to sow into our ministry, we have multiple ways for you to do just that. Check out our description for more options and select the one that works best for you. Now let's go ahead and check out this message. One of the things I get to do pretty often is I get to go and speak at other churches. Uh, you know, all over the place, all over the world. I've gotten a chance to travel. And, and speak to churches about leadership and, and how to build a ministry from scratch. And a lot of ministries actually love for me or even my team members to come in and teach their churches how to do outreaches. Because outreach is intimidating if you've never done it before, to go in to a dangerous community with no connections. A lot of churches, it's not that they don't have good hearts. They just don't really know where to start. And so we, we get a chance to do events like this. And uh, at one event, I was actually in North Carolina. And uh, I, had, I had spoken and I had taught at this conference. And afterwards, the, the pastor wanted to ask me some questions about what I thought about his church and what I thought about his event. And that's not uncommon. I ask every pastor that comes to our church, what did you think? Is there anything we could tweak? And some stuff is good and some stuff I say, well, that's not really our style. I'm okay with what we do. I'm confident in what God gave me, you know, and that's just knowing who you are. But I always listen and ask for what do people think? And so normally I try to hide my facial expressions so people can't tell what I'm thinking. But when he asked me, I just kind of was like, it's good. You know, it's good. And he said, come on, man, tell, tell, me, tell me the truth. And, and I began to start at the parking lot and work my way in to the service. And I took into consideration, you know, what they probably couldn't afford and things like that. But I began to just work my way in. And, I, you know, my first critique was there was nobody opening the door for the guest. And I just began to talk to him about the service. And he was very receptive. And it was a good conversation. But then what he said at the end really frustrated me. And I didn't tell him that, but I got on the plane home and I couldn't stop thinking about it because he said, well, maybe one day I'll have volunteers like you. Maybe one day I'll get a chance to pastor volunteers like you. And I remember, remember scratching my head and saying, is it by chance that so many people serve in our church? Is it by chance that so many people give generously to our church? Is it by chance? And the reason it bothered me is because what he didn't realize is this, and I've learned this through the years. You can teach people what you know, but you can only reproduce what you are. And so what I really wanted to tell him was, they will never come if you don't become it. If, if, if you're not a server, people won't serve. If, if the pastor doesn't show up to outreaches, I can't tell you how many outreaches we go to and community people are shocked that I'm there. They're like, the pastor is here? And to me, it's normal. But to a lot of churches, the pastors don't even touch the outreaches. They have assigned deacons and ministers and sometimes some 85-year-old church moms that go out in the, hat, in the houses with their hats on, knocking on doors. But it's not always common for the pastor to be out there. 
And I don't say that to gloat, but the whole reason I started a ministry was not because I had an ego to preach. It was not because I thought I could preach better than my pastors. I still don't think I could preach better than my old pastors. The reason I started a church is because I got frustrated in my churches that we weren't doing no outreach. It was the whole reason I started a ministry is I wanted to do more outreach. I didn't want handcuffs on when it came to going into the community. I wanted to pastor people that had a heart to do outreach. That's why I didn't take paychecks in the early years. That's why I'm not taking a paycheck now. It's, it's, it's not because I don't believe in that. One day all of that will come. But in the meantime, I would rather give that money to people because that's my heart. I serve. And so the reason... We have people in the parking lot is because I used to serve in a parking lot. The reason we have people in the lobby is because I used to hug people in the lobby. The reason we go to outreach and, and 30 and 40 volunteers show up and we often have to cut it off is because I'm showing up at outreaches and going into the new year, there will be one Sunday a month that I don't preach on Sundays. You know why? Because I know that where you put your money as a leader and where you put your time shows what you care about. And what I'm going to be doing going into the new year is one Sunday a month, I'm going to be in the back pastoring the kids. Because where you put your time shows what you care about. And with, with great speakers coming up in our church, it makes it possible for me to do that and know that the heartbeat will still move forward. Because it's never been about the messenger here at Uproar. It's always been about the message. But I say that to say that nothing happens by chance. Whatever happens in your life will happen because it is who you have become. It is a principle known as, the Bible calls it, seed time, harvest time, reaping, and sowing. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I've learned in life that one of the greatest ways to get God to move, and actually, if I were to preach the Bible and be honest with it, I have never seen somebody in the Bible rise to greatness without serving. Not one person. Not one person. And perhaps this is why Jesus said, as you have seen me do, do, I have given you an example, he said. I have given you an example on how to be happy. I find people that spend all of their money on therapy, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I find people that spend all of their money on alcohol and drugs and some sex. And we try to buy happiness, not realizing that we're making it harder than it's supposed to be. When Jesus said, I can make you happy if you follow my example of washing feet. And actually, to wash feet is kind of disgusting. You know, every person that gets pedicures, make sure you tip the person good. <laughs> Because they are literally touching your feet. Whenever I, I think about pedicures, I think about the episode of Martin. <laughs> That's what it would look like with my feet. If I went in, the whole sander would be out. It may even be like the one scene where the, the, the toenail is flying across the room and hitting somebody in the forehead. But to touch somebody's feet is not something that most people get excited about. And the reason it's not exciting to touch feet is because the feet represent the dirtiest part of the body. And Jesus is showing us 
that the kind of servers he looks for are the people that look for the dirtiest part of the body and throw their life at it. And when you throw yourself at the dirtiest part of the body, it shows God that you are the kind of servant that resembles him. The disciples one time asked Jesus about being great and sitting on the right and the left hand side of him. And he said, the greatest among you, he says in Mark chapter 10, the greatest among you will be the servant among you, the minister among you. He says, greatness is tied to service. Often when I'm questioning whether or not I should mentor somebody, whether or not I should promote somebody, what I do is I tend to put a lot of stuff on them. Because true greatness is measured by how much you can serve. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be the greatest servant among you. So you know that somebody is prepped or primed for greatness when they struggle to say no to the things that God is asking them to do. Because they know that if I can be faithful over a few things, God will make me ruler over many things. Last week, I showed some pictures of my, my upbringing uh, outside of the church for the most part, where I lived as a child, where I lived as an adult all the way up until about 30. And as I was looking through the pictures, I found some that I forgot about, like my baptism picture. 19-year-old me just got baptized in an old historic church in Annapolis that did not have a pool that had a heater. I literally blacked out going down. <laughs> I remember it as clear as day. The pastor said I caught the spirit. I literally blacked out. <laughs> that water was freezing. But I remember getting baptized and immediately jumping into service. Driving church vans all around the city at 19. My pastor said, I said, what do you need me to do? It was a small storefront church. He said, you see that van that's sitting empty? I'd love to have you take it throughout Baltimore and pick families up. And this church was a storefront church in Pasadena, Maryland, way outside of the city. It was the church my girlfriend's family at the time went to. And I just said, okay. So every Saturday night, I got to church the day before service. I took the van. I got it washed. I armor all the inside rubber floors of the van all by myself, put armor all on the tires. The pastor didn't ask me to do none of that. But I wanted the people that I was picking up to have a first class experience. So I did this. I used my own money. I used my own time. I spent my whole afternoon making sure this vehicle was ready. I put gas in it. I never asked the church for a gas card because it was my thing. And I took pride in it. And a lot of times people will see what God has done in my life and say, what is the major thing that caused your life to turn from a kid who was going to court just about a month before I got into church and saved for a felony drug charge? What made you get so involved? What, what did God do? What is the big defining thing that made your whole life turn to where it is now? And I say it is not an opportunity for speaking. It is, it is not the church I started. It can all be traced back to me driving that church van around and God seeing that I could be faithful every week. And I remember there was one time, just one time, I ain't gonna lie, I got saved and I have struggles. There was one time I overslept because I was drunk. And I felt so bad. And all those church mothers in their hats chewed me out the next week for making them wait. And it was raining. And they're sitting out on the corners waiting for me. And I'll never forget, I called out sick. I texted sick. That's what, that's what you do when you don't have the courage to be up front. I texted. Not feeling good. May not answer any text back. <laughs> and the church was so small, you know what the pastor did? He came to my house. <laughs> knocked on the door to pray for me. I felt so little. I said, Lord, I'll never miss again if I'm needed. Yeah. And from that point to now, 
I can count on two hands. It's been a little while. But I can count on at least two hands and not even use all my fingers for the amount of Sundays I've missed since I was 19. Even when I'm on vacation, true story, if I'm on vacation, I'm finding a church. I, when I was a kid, I had a Catholic uncle who would take us on vacations with them. And every Sunday, he would get up on vacation while we were all sleeping, kids and all, his wife was sleeping. He would go by himself and find a Catholic church to go to church to in Ocean City. And that was a model before me. And so even now, if I'm gone, I'm going to try to find a church. And most of the time when I'm not here, I'm at a church service being used. I schedule my vacations around things. Why? Because I made a promise to God that I'll never leave your people in the rain again. It all started there. And then they moved me up to recording the pastor's messages and sitting in the back room recording all the messages on the cassette tapes while the lines of people were waiting for them after service. And then about a year after this, I went from getting baptized to doing all the baptisms for the church. And I was at Sandy Point and I baptized about 12 people, including the girl in front of me, my ex fiance at the time. Because God was opening up doors. And then about a year after that, a little less, I was being ordained as a minister. And then about a year after that, I was graduating with my bachelor's in theology. I just threw my life into it. And where I am now is not by chance. It is because from the time I got saved, I literally threw my everything into this. And so... When it comes to service, people will say, man, you, you preach on service a lot. It's because it's all I know. One time I had an old church mom come to me and said, I wish you preached more holiness. And I knew her husband, and he talked to me at men's groups. She said, I wish you preached more holiness. I said, well, what, what does that look like to you? You need to talk to those single people. I know what they're doing in church. And I said, okay, this Sunday I'm going to talk to them. But I'm also going to talk to the women like you that have not been having enough sex with your husband. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> defraud ye not one another, lest you give Satan room to tempt you. Holiness can tend to be moved around based on how we want to manipulate people. And I have found that true holiness is, yes, God does care about the wife and the husband that's not having enough and the single people that are having too much. God does care about all of that. But I've learned that when you start walking in your calling, God begins to convict you about what you need to get in order to be holy before him. So what do I teach? I teach giving because... I've been tithing since I was 19. My mom didn't teach me the tithe. I didn't come up in Sunday school. I just got saved and said, if that's what God wants, I will wait on the Lord. And my car got repossessed two times. But God said he wanted it, and I did it. It's all I know is giving and serving. And when people say, how do you have a church that you have now? How, how, how has God given you these opportunities? I always go back to my base. It's giving and serving. And God has opened up door after door after door after door in my life. It's being faithful over the few things till he makes you ruler over many things. Be not deceived. He's not mocked. What you sow, you reap. I like what Galatians 6, 9 says. It says, and be not weary in well-doing. For if we, we shall reap in due season, if we faint not, as we therefore opportunity. See, when you're faithful with where you are, God gives you an opportunity. 
And every person in this room has either had one or is going to get one. I'm going to give you one more verse and I'm moving on quickly. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, it says, the race is not to the swift. That means the people that are going to be blessed are not the people that are the fastest to getting there. The, the battle is not given to the strong. It's not going to be the people that look like they can bring down Goliath. It's not going to be King Saul. It's going to be David. Neither bread to the wise. Your education is not going to get you there. Your education is, is not going to uh, cause God to give you a breakthrough. Nor riches to men of understanding. That means God's not going to make you rich just because you understand the stock market. He says, nor favor to men of skill. But here it is. But time and chance happen to all. Not chance and time. Time and chance. And the original reading doesn't say chance like, oh, I woke up one day. No, no, no. It means time and a chance. That means what you do with your time is going to determine whether or not God gives you a chance. But God says, I'm going to give every person, if you're using your time right, this is why the Bible says, teach us to number our days. Because a lot of us are running out of time. And God is saying, if you want a chance, I need you to shift how you prioritize your time. I showed you those, those pictures. I gave up a lot. I gave up boxing. I was the number one middleweight in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. I think it was last Father's Day or the Father's Day before. I had my boxing trainer up here talking about how good I was and, and how much I trained. I gave it up. Why? Because it was pulling away from my time with God. I found myself saying no to my church a lot. And I said, I can't say no to God. He's been too good to me. So I'm going to give up my Isaac and slay it on the altar because God has a requirement for me to be used, to be used. I'd walk away from jobs. I'd walk away from distractions. I'd walk away from friends. I remember one time I was single and lonely and, and there was this girl in the church that really liked me and I, I said, Pastor, what do you think? And, and he said, I, I don't like it. I don't trust it. And I said, okay. And I got sneaky. And I, I went out with her anyway. And true story. We're, we're, I took her out to eat. I, I walked her up trying to be a nice guy. I walked her up to the door. And she literally pulled out protection and said, you want to come in? And I was like, yeah, pastor wasn't lying. <laughs> I was trying to keep myself, I was trying to stay focused. <laughs> Pastor wasn't lying. And I literally went back and said, you weren't lying. This is what I did. This is where I messed up. It'll never happen again. And to this day, I'm 40, and I don't make no decisions unless my bishop knows. Why? Because I'm running out of time. Yeah. And when you look at your life, and it's not where it should be and it's not where you thought it would be it's reaping and sowing it's seed time harvest time you are the only one that can change the direction because if you keep doing what you did last year guess where you're going to be next year if you haven't made any drastic moves since last december 31st what makes you think this january 1st is going to be any different and as we enter into the fourth quarter, God is giving us not a chance, because it's not by chance. He's giving us an opportunity to shift the outcome of our lives, shift the outcome of our families, shift the outcome of our finances. I 
don't know who I'm talking to, but there is at least one or two people here, maybe 20 or 30, that are saying, Lord, I need a shift. I need something to happen. I need a thing to turn. I can't go on another year like this. I can't go on another day like this. I can't go on another hour like this. Jesus, I need you to show up. Jesus, I need you to give me some strength. Jesus, I need you to give me some healing. Jesus, I I need you to give me some energy. Jesus, I need you to give me some vision. Is there anybody here that says, Jesus, I have a need today. Jesus, if you don't show up, I'm not going to make it. Jesus, if you don't show up, my family's going to be destroyed. Jesus, if you don't show up, we're going to get divorced. Jesus, if you don't show up, I'm going to die. Jesus, if you don't show up, my world is going to come crumbling down. Touch two people and say, show up, Jesus. Jesus Jesus is trying to give somebody an opportunity. Therefore, having opportunity, the Bible says, let us do good to all people, your boss, your friends, your co-workers. Let us do good to all people, but especially, Galatians 6.10 says, but especially those of the household faith because the building you walked into is your opportunity Jacob saw his vision he saw the ladder going up to heaven he saw steps to go higher and he saw a system a cycle things coming down things going up he saw a cycle and he said this when he woke up is the house of the Lord and I knew it not When God puts you into a house, he expects you to be all in because there's a system that takes place. And if God can get you to step in to the system, you will see what life looks like when heaven sends things down and you have enough in your pocket to send heaven something back up. It is a a system. It is service. Look at somebody say, it's not by chance. When it comes to Mordecai, he was a servant. When we see him in Esther chapter 10, his whole world has turned since the guy who lost his uncle and had to adopt his little cousin, Esther, He was the scribe that was ready to lose his life by Haman. He was a nobody. The king didn't even know his name. When the king heard about how he stopped an assassination plot, he said, who is this Mordecai? The king didn't even know him. He was living in Susa, which was the poorest part of Persia. And when we get to Esther chapter 10, It is almost like a Joseph moment. Joseph, the boy who went from the pit to serving in Potiphar's house to the prison to the palace. It's almost one of those moments where it's like, how did this happen when it comes to Joseph? How did this Hebrew boy become number two in all of Egypt under the Pharaoh? It is kind of like a David moment. How did the shepherd boy learn how to command armies and now become the king of all of Israel, the man after God's own heart? It is almost like a Moses moment. How did the baby that almost died now get the job to lead over a million people? It is kind of like Gehazi, who in 2 Judges chapter 6 or 5, 5, chapter 5, he is getting leprosy. He used to be the servant of Elisha. He gets leprosy. He gets banned. His children get leprosy. But when you get to 2 Kings 8, he is number two to the king. How does God take trash and make it into treasure? The Bible says he has a way of taking those things that aren't and making them into the things that he says they are supposed to be. It is his way of taking foolish things 
and making them great to confound the wise. This is why we should never despise the day of small things. Because where you are now is not an indicator of where you're going to be when God gets done with you. Amen. This is one of the reasons I hate not only when people find you in a good place in life, because often when people find you in a good place in life, they look at you and they don't understand the grind that went into getting to where you are. And they minimize the grind because they don't realize all you had to do to get your anointing. There's some people in here that'll tell you, you know, my anointing cost me something. My anointing put me through some hell to get this anointing. I had to be hurt. I had to be backstabbed. I had to be betrayed. I had to be talked about. It goes all the way back to my childhood. I had to be mishandled. I had to be let down. My father wasn't there. I didn't have the luxuries of everybody else. There are some people here that will tell you this on anointing cost something. This anointing almost made me take my life. This anointing almost had me under a bridge. This anointing cost me a home. This anointing cost me a relationship. This anointing almost cost me my family. Is there anybody here that can look back over your life and see how your anointing was not cheap? You had to go through some stuff. You've got a story. You've got a testimony. If anybody else went through half of what you went through, they they wouldn't be standing today. They wouldn't have their minds today. They'd be in a hospital. They'd be medicated. But it was God's hand on your life because he was not killing you. He had you in the wine press and he was getting that anointing out of you. Say, I'm anointed. Say, it costs something. It costs something. That's why whenever you see somebody really anointed, understand they have been extremely crushed. Whenever somebody ministers to me, I don't go up and say great message to them. I go up to them and I say, thank you for your life. Because I know that kind of message could only touch that part of me if God puts you through hell for me. So I don't say great message. Because any preacher will tell you their message is their trash. <laughs> this makes the message. My heart makes the message. My testimony makes the message. The anointing of God on my life makes the message. I can't put my message into 45 to 60 minutes. My team will tell you where we go out and have lunch. I could talk for another five hours on this message because I can't get all of my thoughts out in 60 minutes. That's why the greatest gift that God can give you is a good mentor or a spiritual father, because they're gonna share with you more than 60 minutes in a message. They're gonna impart something to you that makes your life better. The anointing costs something. But whenever God is raising up somebody, he has to crush them, whether it's Esther losing her parents to become king, Queen, I mean, or, or Mordecai having to go through hell. I hate when people find me in a good place. Like the pastor that said, maybe one day I'll get a team like yours. This team took 15 years to build. You don't realize how many people came and how many people went. How, 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 many, how many seashells the ocean blew up on the beach, but you also don't realize how many seashells the ocean pulled back. You don't realize how hard it was. You don't realize how hard it was to build when people get mad and they cut back on their tithe. And you can't make solid decisions. So when you can't make decisions and you can't fake it, you have to faith it. And faith, Paul would say, is a fight. I hate when people find me in a good place. But I also hate when people find me in a bad place. Because often, the tragedy of people is that they define you by how they find you. And they never let you escape. Even when you break out, they still talk to you in a way that makes you go back. So Mordecai, when you see him in Esther 10, 
Look at how far he's come. Esther chapter 10, verse 1 says this. We can pull that up. There it is. And the king Arazerses laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea. It, it, it was a land decree and an island decree. And all the acts and the power of his might and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, and they are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Media and of Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next to the king Araxerxes, and great among the Jews, accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed, his seed, his seed. That's what you gave today, a seed, seeds grow. He spoke peace to what was growing, peace to what was in the future. When you see him, and almost if you come into this stage of his life, he's talking this different, dressing different. Everything about his life looks grand. But if you minimize where he came from, you can overlook the principles that a person has applied to get to where they are. The footsteps of a good man are ordered. You can minimize or overlook the steps that God took a person to and through to become great. So I don't want to give you commandments today, but I thought about giving you Mordecai's ingredients. The stuff that made Mordecai, Mordecai. And I call it Mordecai's 10 ingredients of service. The graphic behind me is from a guy named Salt Bay. True story, I was in Istanbul. And he has restaurants all over Istanbul. And it was the best burger I ever had in my life. They do this thing where they infuse it. They come to your table and they put this big needle in your burger and they infuse it with cheese. I know I'm not a big cheese person, but let me tell you, this burger will be the best thing you've had on this side of heaven. But it's Salt Bay and he is just sprinkling his salt. Anyway, the 10 ingredients that Mordecai would give us for service. When we look at his life, and I'm going to breeze through these, but number one, Mordecai would say, you cannot serve right if you do not have a pinch of protection. When Mordecai took Esther in, he didn't take her in out of pity. You cannot serve out of pity. He took her in because he was a protector. And God was looking at how he protected Esther. And God knew that if you can protect that little girl like that, I can trust you to protect my nation like that one day. It is often when you are a nobody that you minimize the fact that God is looking at you now more than he will look at you when you arrive. For when you arrive, you have proven yourself. That's why you're there. He has no need to look at you once you arrive. He is looking at you in the process. When you have nothing, when you are getting started, when you feel like a failure, when you're still struggling, when you're not the perfect Christian, when you're not the perfect man, when you're not the perfect woman, he is looking at you when you get started. He is looking at you when you're still drinking. He is looking at you when you're still smoking. He is looking at you when you're still going from bedroom to bedroom and what he is saying is can I get you to get started where you are and we'll deal with the struggles as we walk together yeah. and if we're not careful we talk ourselves out of being used now not realizing that God is more concerned with how you handle what he's giving you now than how you will handle it later because if you're faithful with nothing why would you not be faithful with everything? So Mordecai was a protector. He protected Esther. He took her in. He didn't really know what he was doing raising a little girl, but he tried. He tried. He gave it his best. He did such a good job that she eventually became queen. 
God has a way of not giving you what's ideal. But he'll give you what you need to become the leader he's called you to be. He took her in. He watched out for her. He was a protector. One of the things we teach and engage here is for those that serve, your main responsibility is to protect our guest. From the kids' ministry to the parking lot, we take protection very seriously. Background checks, security guards walking around, hard conversations with our staff and volunteers because people do not care how well you serve them if they do not feel like you will protect them. So Mordecai would say it takes a pinch of protection. Say a pinch of protection. The, the next pinch that Mordecai would say that it takes is a, a pinch of preparation. Say nothing just happens. You have to prepare. You have to prepare. I, I went to a church some time back on a Sunday to preach. And, and I, it was probably about a year ago. And their only worship practice of the week was on Sunday morning. And it didn't surprise me that it was horrible. Well, the Lord will meet us here. And I'm like, well, y'all don't sound like you're on one accord. Preparation. Good service takes preparation. People are working full-time jobs and then still not getting home till 11 p.m. every night here. It's preparation. Worship practices go to midnight on Wednesdays. It's preparation. Our worship team, man, they are all great. Not one of them thought they could sing before they started singing. We actually have a few others, but they're serving in other areas of the ministry where they're needed because here at Uproar, we don't sign up for positions. We sign up for serving. So wherever I'm needed, that, that's where I go. But, but the best singers are not up here. They've gone to voice training. They, they practice relentlessly till they get those songs together, all of that kind of stuff. The best singers are not up here, but you know who's up here? The ones that will prepare through the week. Because true service takes preparation. Our parking lot has preparation. Our greeters have preparation. The kids' curriculums in the back are prepared way before the kids get here, way before the weekend. Walkthroughs on this building have to take place on Friday nights. I look for texts on Fridays saying that this building is service ready and cleaned by Friday night. Nobody's going to be vacuuming on Sunday morning here. It is game day. Because if we don't show up ready, then why would God send us first-time guests? I prepare for my message. I put 30 hours a week into my sermons because I care. I don't need my notes. My notes are in me. I prepare because every time I step on this stage, I'm assuming that if I don't give it my best, somebody's going to hell, some marriage is falling apart, some mom is going to get discouraged with where her daughter is and what she has going on, some father with his son. I have to be prepared for the lost. It takes preparation. Mordecai prepared Esther for the palace. He prepared her for where she was going, not where she was. A good mentor prepares you for where they see you going, not based upon where you are right now. Mordecai had eagle vision. He prepared her to be queen. He told her what name she should use. He told her how to talk, how to dress, how to carry herself, what to do, what not to do. M Mordecai was a man of preparation. Say a pinch of preparation. Pinch of preparation. Mordecai would say that our next pinch is this, a pinch of principle. You cannot serve and be a person without principle. It's been said like this to me before. You cannot expect for God to make you succeed until you determine what you won't do to succeed. 
This is what I will not do to arrive. This is what I will not do to get a man. This is what I will not do to get a woman. These are my, my principles. When they bury me one day, hopefully many years from now, unless the Lord comes back, I want them to say we are burying a man of principle. Even if everybody don't agree with my principles, I want to be a person of principle. When Haman was riding through the town, Mordecai refused to bow down. Why? Because like David, I'm not impressed by what everybody else sees as big. Are you a person of principle? Principle. And this, this builds up to the next one, a pinch of problems. Because the minute you become a person of principle, problems come. The devil doesn't mind you when you don't have principle. But the minute you start making principle, like me saying at 19, I'll never miss again, principle. And so I've been up here with a bad back. I've been up here with a dislocated hip. I've been up here with the flu. I've been up here when I didn't feel like being up here, when my heart was broken, when my feelings were shattered. Why? Because my principle does not lessen based upon my conditions. It takes a pinch of principle. It is hard to stand when everybody else is bowing. Because when you stand, understand, and this is, this, is, this is it right here. When everybody else bows and you stand, that is the price tag for standing taller than everyone. Jesus said, think not that I came to bring peace. I came with a sword. I came, and I'm just paraphrasing Matthew 10. I came to turn homes upside down. All the men that used to teach me coming up in church were old school fellas. And they would all have these stories about getting saved and going home and wrecking their homes. And I remember when I got saved, I think it's the reason my fiance left me back then. I remember I got saved. I walked in to the kitchen. We were going to have dinner at her, her, her family's house. And I slammed the Bible on the table and said, there's some things we got to get in order. And I think that was the spiral. <laughs> but I'm still that way. My daughter, Modesty, in the back, who I've raised, who has lived, you know, with my family since she was, you know, 17, 16, 17 years old. You know, family put her out. Mom passed away. I took her in. I put her flower on her to send her away to her prom. When I'm passionate about something, she will tell you, I don't bend even in my home when it comes to the principles that I stand for. And I learned that from the old godly men in my church that would hear pastor preach and go home and demand that the family fell in line with it. And it sent ripple effects. And they would be getting counseling because they would be cut off for a season. But they made demands, we're not doing this no more. We're not celebrating that any longer. It's not up for a debate. Dad, explain it. Why? I'm not explaining to you what even I don't understand right now. All I can tell you is I have a peace that this is what God wants in this season. Yeah. Everything cannot be explained when God is dealing with you. Yeah. Some things just need to be prayed about. But God is always looking for people of principle. What are your principles? What won't you do to succeed? Because they're going to bring problems. And I would argue that if you don't have any problems in your life, you are not a person of principle. Wow. Our next pitch. Say a pinch of problems. Say a pinch of principle. Our next one is this. A pinch of Priority. What are your priorities in life? 
Is it your family? Is it your church? Is it your God? Sometimes I'll hear people say things like this. Well, God, family, church. You can't do that because that's letting the kids come between the husband and wife. The bride of Christ is his church. And often God sees how much you love him by how much you prioritize his wife. It would be like me telling you, come on over the house, but leave that woman home. The two come together. They are a package. And often the invisible God gives you a visible bride and says, don't tell me how much you love me. Show me how much you love me by what you do for her. And she may be stinky. And she may be a little corrupt. And she may have had some problems. And we're sorry. But she became imperfect the moment you walked in too. And she may be talked about. And she may have some scandals. But she is still my wife. And she is still the best thing on this side of heaven. He had... Priority. What are your priorities? He said, Esther, I have caught wind that Haman is going to take out. We're going to talk about Haman in a few weeks. I have caught wind that Haman is going to take out all of our people, including me, and I need you to go before the king. Now, understand this, cousin. If anybody goes before the king, they will die. I understand. I need you to go before the king. This is really an Abraham Isaac moment. Because he doesn't know that she's going to live. But he has priorities. And he will not allow what God is showing him to be interrupted because of a law that's been set in place. So he lays down what he loves for the sake of what he knows God is telling him to do. You can only do this because Esther could clearly die going before the king. That's why I say this is an Abraham-Isaac moment. He is giving what he loves for the purpose of God. And it didn't go that way like Abraham didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. But often God will put you in a place to test your priorities. So where are your priorities? He, he, he would tell us that it takes a pinch of priorities, but also a pinch of perception. Perception. What I love about Mordecai is that in his serving, he was always looking. He was always listening. He was a man of perception. It says when he perceived what was taking place in Esther chapter 4. When he perceived that a plot had taken place. What, at one time, he, he was in the, the, the courtyard and he perceived or caught ear that two men were walking out talking about an assassination plot with the king. He was always serving and listening. Serving and watching. Per perception. He's, he's not just showing up. He's, he's looking at everything taking place in the setting around him. Because when you serve, you have to be a person of perception to go above and beyond. Because how can you know there's a need if you don't see it? And here's the other catch. How can you see the problem that God has called you to solve if you're never looking for a problem in the first place. So he was a man of perception. He didn't just catch wind of what Haman was doing. He caught wind of what people were trying to do to the king. And as we get towards the end, it sets up our next pitch. A pinch of provision. Because whenever you're perceptive, whenever you're in position to serve, provision is always coming. You don't have to manipulate it. You don't have to remind people. 
God has a way of showing you he's God. It says one night the king's just sleeping. And he couldn't sleep. He's tossing and turning and sweating. And he gets up and he says, I want to hear a boring story. So he has his people pull the book of the Chronicles, the books that the scribes would write about all the events of the day that, that the king would have to hear about. The president does these every single uh, evening. They're just debriefings where you're hearing about all the things going on in the U.S., all the things going on in Israel, all the things going on in Russia, Ukraine, Europe, France, North Korea, China, Japan, you're getting all the debriefing. And I don't know anybody that gets excited to hear all that. Who gets excited to hear a list of how much you're needed? So he says, just read a book. Uh, just put me to sleep. Read the book of the Chronicles. And the, the person found the part that said Mordecai told about the two men that had an assassination plot against the king. And the king said, what reward has been done for him? See, God has a way of making people toss and turn to bless you. Whether it's disrupting somebody's money or taking somebody's sleep or attacking somebody's body, God will get you the blessing that he has for your life. Nobody can stop it when it's your time. It's your time. When it's your season, it's your season. God doesn't need people to like it. God doesn't need people to agree with it. But when God is ready to promote you, when God is ready to give you some provision, he will shake things up. He will take people's sleep. He will do whatever he has to do to make sure your name comes up. It says he took the king's sleep and said what reward? See when you're really trusting in God you don't have to worry about how are you going to get there. You know that if God sees what you've been doing God is going to make sure that you get there. So the king said, what's been done? What's been done? There is somebody watching that God wants me to tell you today. He's been seeing all that you've been doing. He's been watching you do so much with so little. He, he's been watching you love the unlovable. He, he's been watching you get up when your body says, Stay down. He's been watching you giving when you didn't even have enough left over to do something for yourself. And God wants you to know your season is coming. He is not going to forget about you. He is not going to move on from you. He is going to get you to the place that you are supposed to be when you are supposed to be there. So don't get weary in well-doing in due season. You are going to reap. He is going to give you your moment. So Mordecai is getting provision. And, and whether it's Moses or David or Gehazi, there comes the moment where you get snatched from your old world and you never have to look at it again. Say a pinch of provision. And with the provision comes promotion. A pinch of promotion. The man who walked through the streets in cloth, that's what it says, he ripped his cloth when he found out there was a, a, a plot against the Jews. Look at him now. It says, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel, blue, white, with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and, and honor. Mordecai getting blessed made everybody happy. And every providence and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. There were many people saying, you know what? Make me Jewish. 
Because that's what promotion looks like. God puts you in front to show people why they should want to serve him. God makes you the boss so that others will see why they should be a Christian. God gives you the money so others would see why they should be a Christian. God gives you the position so others can see why they should be a Christian. God gives you the healing so people can see why they should be a Christian. God gives you the relationship so others can see why they should be a Christian. God doesn't want to hide you. He wants to put you in a position so that others will say, I want to be like you so I can get what you got. And Mordecai didn't just dress new. It says, he led the armies of the Jewish people. And they had victory after victory after victory. Because Mordecai encouraged them. He was a man of promotion. Because when you serve, promotion is a promise. And it's not promotion in the church. I don't care if I'm promoted in the church. I never tried to be promoted in the church. People that often want to be promoted in the church tend to go from church to church. Because it doesn't happen fast enough. I have never cared about promotion in the church. I want promotion in my life. I want a good Monday through Saturday. Jesus didn't die so I could have good church. Jesus died so I could have good life. I want to rise on my job. I want to rise with my family. I want to rise with my friends. I want to rise with my healing. I want to rise in my life. Mordecai went from being a scribe to the prime minister. He was of the group of people that were hated. And the group of people the king was getting ready to kill is now the king's number two. And it shows you that when you get your service down, God will promote you to such a position that makes no sense. He was promoted. And what I forgot to tell you earlier is Mordecai's name means servant of Murdoch. Murdoch was the Babylonian god of loyalty and justice. But he was a servant of Murdoch, which means that when Mordecai came in the room, service came in the room. He was named service. Service towards justice and loyalty. That's why he was so big on fighting for his people. He wanted equal justice in the land. But he was not servant of Jehovah. They named him servant of Murdoch. And I think I like that more than servant of Jehovah. Because to every person that didn't start good and every person that people gave a bad name to at some point in your life, it shows you that you do not have to be what people called you. You do not have to live up to what people said about you. If you want to change the curse or reverse it, you have the power to do so. You don't have to be what everybody says. You don't have to stay where they found you. You don't have to live by their approval and die by their rejection. No. When God God has his hand on you. You can, you can flip the script. So, so all he knew to do was serve, 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 serve. That's what he did. And service took him from living on the bad side of town in cloth, clothing, to sitting in the palace with the king. He had promotion. But this may be actually one of my favorite ones right here. It's not promotion, but peace. Yeah. 
It says he brought peace to his yes. people. Yes. True servants do not bring chaos, confusion. When you get me, peace has come in the room. There are certain people that come into your life that you want in the room if your mother or father is dying. There are certain people that come into your life that you want to talk to if the doctor finds something. There are certain people that if your marriage is crumbling, just their presence will bring a little bit of hope. When you got Mordecai, he was that person. When you get me, peace is still. He brought peace. God said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. God has a way of putting servants in power positions. Because when you get me, you get peace. People ask me this time of the year, who should I vote for? And I'm going to tell you, you know who you should vote for today? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but I always say this. When you take a breath, think about who brings the nation the most peace. And peace does not mean lack of arguing. What peace means is the destruction of confusion. When you got Mordecai, you got peace in the land. God is saying the reason I need you to get some peace in your life is because if I am going to promote you, I need peace to come with you. Mordecai would say it takes a pinch of peace. When God puts you in positions, do you bring peace? Or are you the opposite of peace? And lastly, it takes just a pinch, just a pinch of purpose. <laughs> what Mordecai didn't realize is the reason he took Esther in when others would have pushed her away. The, the, the reason he wasn't killed with his family is because there was purpose over his life. And the minute you start realizing that there's purpose over your life is the moment you see the urgency in serving. Because God saved me for my purpose. God brought me into the world for my purpose. I was 19 years old and I realized, man, I should have been dead. I should have been in jail. I had no business having a good God take a chance on me. I had no business on having a good God allow me. See, I never saw it as a burden. I never saw it as a pity. No, 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 no. To serve my church and drive that van around. To this day, I don't care what God asked me to do. It is still the greatest opportunity that I could be given is to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, whether it's a church van or preaching or taking groceries to a family in the housing communities. It's all service. And for 20 years, I have never stopped seeing this as an opportunity. I have never stopped saying, thank you, Lord, because I could be dead. Thank you, Lord. I could be in jail. Thank you, Lord. I could still be drinking myself to sleep. Thank you, Lord. I could still be smoking my pain away. Thank you, Lord. I could still be going from bedroom to bedroom. Thank you, Lord, because you gave a boy a shot who was headed towards hell. 
And for 20 years, I've still been grateful. For 20 years, I still preach for the one and not the 99. God is always looking for somebody that says, Lord, I'm so thankful that you put a purpose on my life. I'm so thankful that you never left me nor forsaken me. I'm so thankful that you never allowed those weapons to prosper against me. I'm so thankful that you took me from the pits and put me in the palace. I'm just so thankful because I could have been somewhere else, but I'm here and because I have a purpose. Mordecai's whole life was purpose and every pinch and every ingredient was a step that got him closer. And if you would have came in at this season of his life, you would have never thought he had that season. And if you would have came in when he took in Esther and he was poor, you would have never believed he could get to that season. But understand this, whether it's where he started to where he ended, there was nothing about Mordecai's life that was by chance. It was all on purpose. And there will be nothing about your life that is by chance. You You will not wake up one day and have a lottery reaction. (laughs) That is not how purpose works. It takes time to get your chance. And when your chance comes, it is going to catch you completely off guard. I close with this. I shared the story a few months ago. I talk about it because it was my big victory last year, so I'm going to talk about it till my next victory. (laughs) But I was 26, standing on the stage at the Potter's House saying to one man, one day I'm going to preach here. The guy that gave the tour said, don't hold your breath. I've heard many people say that. Last year, a couple weeks before my birthday, I preached at the Potter's House. My spiritual father never comes to Bible studies usually when he has guest speakers. That's why he brings in a guest speaker. He came to sit on the front row to support me. My friend and my brother, Keon Henderson, flew in just to hear me. All of my other pastor friends came in that were around the city because they wanted to support me. I always thought I'd have a month to prepare before I got that shot. That's what I always say. I I even told my team, I said, man, when that day comes, and it's going to come one day, I'm going to take off the whole month and have guest preachers so I can work on one message that will just (laughs) knock the Grand Slam out of the park. He, He called me at 7 p.m., 6.30 p.m. I was talking to him about a vulnerable situation. I didn't expect nothing. He said, okay, we'll deal with that. But why don't you come preach for me tomorrow? And this is 6.30 on a Tuesday night. He said, come for 7 p.m. Texas time, which is 6 p.m. my time. Less than 24 hours, I want you to come and preach to almost 30,000 people between online and in-house. Almost 60,000 more people will watch your sermon on replay within the next few days. And I had no time to study. I got up there and didn't look at my notes once. They were laughing. I was sitting on the stage and preaching. I was running across the stage. Why? Because you can't prepare for great moments in a month. I had been being prepared by God my whole life. (laughs) 
And if I would have not been prepared, I would have prayed for a chance and blew it when the phone rung. If the phone rung today, how well would you handle the chance? Because for somebody, your phone's about to ring and you got a little bit of catching up to do. As we stand to our feet, Jesus was trying to teach the disciples this. And he washed their feet. He went for the dirtiest part of the body, as I said earlier. He didn't go for the cleanest. He went for the, the, the dirtiest. Everybody you saw singing up here on this stage when they came in, I told you not one of them ever thought they would sing. Not one of them thought they could sing. It was just listening and, you know, one person was, had energy. We said, okay, well, even if you can't sing, we'll mute your mic and you can just, you know. <laughs> no lie, we did that a few times over the years. Y'all just didn't know. Not with these groups. This, this group's good, but in the past, we've done that before. They were just discovered. Jamel never thought he could sing. Ursula never thought she could sing. They never sang in school and stuff like that. Kendra never thought she could sing. Um, Amaris never thought she could sing. I still remember Amaris coming in about three years ago, crying her eyes out at the altar for the first time. And after service, she hugged me and said, I just want to thank you for putting them billboards up because I was in a bad place in my life. And that was my sign from God that he still had plans for me. Now she's teaching new membership classes and singing on stages. The one thing they all have in common, Jalen sets up the parking lot at 6 a.m. every Sunday. He's getting there with other guys. The one thing they all had in common is they all came in saying, what do you need from me? What do you need from me? And that's why they will go from there to the parking lot, not even complain and still be happy and move in. Why? Because not one of them signed up for the stage. They signed up for the service. Amen. And I've learned over the years, as I said earlier, you can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. And the reason that God has sent so many amazing people into the ministry is not because I've taught this stuff, but for the 20 years of my walk, I've lived this stuff. Amen. Good times, bad times, always going after the dirtiest part of the body. Jesus said, I gave you an example. What example? What for, Jesus? He said in verse 17, because I want you to do these things and be happy. Serve and be happy. Serve and go from Shushan and cloth to standing next to the king and be happy. And the reason I chose to close with this is because the word happy is defined or derived from the word happenings. And the reason the church don't like to use happy, we like to use the word joy. I don't have happiness. I have joy, but God wants you to be happy too, or he wouldn't have said it. But in order for you to be happy means that something has to happen. And God is saying that if I can get you to serve, I'll make you happy because I'm going to make some things start happening in your life. Things that you never saw coming are going to start happening. People that used to be so unlovable are going to become lovable because something is going to start happening. Your children who hate God right now are going to be in church very soon because something is getting ready to happen. You thought God forgot about you. You, you, you thought maybe something was wrong with you. But God says, there's nothing wrong with you. The man, the woman, they're coming. Yeah. But I was holding them back because I wanted to get you serving. 
because I wanted to make something happen. But I couldn't make something happen until you were willing to touch feet. And once I saw that you were willing to touch feet, I started to make some things happen in your life. I don't know who I'm talking to, but as we get ready to shift into the end of 2024, God wants somebody to know I'm about to make you happy because I'm about to make some things start happening in your life. If it ain't for you, be quiet. But there is somebody that I'm talking to and God is saying, I dare you to clap. I dare you to shout. I dare you to get excited. I dare you to kick the enemy off today because something is getting ready to happen. It may happen before you get home. It may happen before the month is up. It may happen before the year is up. But something is going to happen. God is saying you are about to have your happiest season. But nothing can happen if you don't Take off your garment and touch some feet. If, if you don't like Mordecai, start adding some pinches of service into your life. I can't make you happy because you're not doing the thing that makes things happen. There is somebody that needs something to happen today. There is somebody who cannot remember the last time you were happy. And God is saying, I'm going to shift it today. But I need a shift in your life.